Hey everyone, Sam here. Thanks for joining me. I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are in the world. In this video, I'm going to show you how to create atmospheric depth within a landscape painting. So this is making landforms recede into the distance, or in this case, it's a mountain that's receding into the distance. And we can do this by getting our values and our colors correct. Now, if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Now, just before we start, I'd like to quickly tell you about Portfolio Box and then we'll get straight into the video. So if you're an artist or creative and you're looking to make your own website, then check out PortfolioBox.net. It's an online website builder where you can create your own beautiful website to showcase your work to the highest standard. There's loads of styles and templates for you to choose from and it's really easy to use. The whole thing works through drag and drop. You can start building your website right away and then when you want it to go live you simply choose the plan you wish to purchase and right now Portfolio Box are offering a 50% discount for the first year on any of their plans by typing in the discount code SAMERP50 and I've put the link and the discount code in the description box below. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, let's get into it. The inspiration for this painting comes from a place called Glen Orkey, which is a little village in southern New Zealand and it's surrounded by these beautiful high mountains. Now when I used to live in Queenstown, which is about 45 minutes away, I used to come here all the time to go plain air painting. There's just so much inspiration here. I'm painting on an 8 inch by 10 inch linen panel. And these are made by a company in the USA called canvaspanels.com. I've been doing quite a few of these small paintings lately because what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose some to do bigger paintings from. These linen panels are perfect for small paintings and plain air painting. I've toned the linen surface with a layer of burnt sienna which I applied earlier on as a wash and then I allowed it to dry for a few days. This helps to warm up the painting and it gives it a more traditional feel. I'm using oil paint here, but you could also use acrylics if you wanted to. And the colours I used include titanium white, burnt sienna, yellow oxide, cadmium yellow, quinacridone crimson, ultramarine blue, cobalt teal and thalo green. I'm also using a range of mostly number 5 and number 2 flat brushes number three filbert brushes and number one and number zero round brushes. I sketch out my composition with burnt sienna mixed with liquid original and the liquid original improves the flow of the paint and speeds up the drying time. Very useful if you want to get lots of paintings done quickly. Right so I've sketched out my composition let's sling some paint on this thing. The theme of this video is atmospheric perspective, so this is making landforms recede into the distance in your painting by using the correct values and colours. Now value refers to how light or dark a subject is, and this is the first thing I think about when I begin a painting. Now what I've done in this case is I've started off with the sky so I can gauge the rest of the values against that. But normally I always think about getting my dark values and shadows established first. I paint the sky with a mix of ultramarine blue, titanium white and a little bit of cobalt teal. And I apply the paint with a number 5 flat brush. Once I've marked in the sky I then establish the shadows on the side of the mountain. And this is a mix of ultramarine blue with some burnt sienna which is actually a dark orange so orange being opposite to blue on the colour wheel it desaturates the colour. I mix in titanium white to make the value lighter and then I also add in a little bit of quinacridone crimson to give the mix a violet tint but I edge that mixture much more on the blue side. Now at this distance those shadows are not going to be as dark as if they are in the foreground and that's because we'll find our darkest darks and our lightest lights in the foreground but as landforms recede darks are not as dark and lights are not quite as light 
as the value scale narrows. When it comes to observing values and light in the landscape, the artist John Carlson noticed that prime elements within the landscape, for example the ground, the trees, mountains, all receive different types of light according to their planes. John Carlson also noticed that there were four prime planes within the landscape. There's the sky and the source of light, and this is also where some of the lightest values to be found in the landscape are. Then there's the ground planes, which are often a little bit darker in value than the sky. And this includes meadows, fields and grass, for example. You then have your slanting planes. These include things like mountains and hills, often much darker in value, especially where there's exposed rocky surfaces. And then you have your upright planes, the trees, which are some of the darkest values to be found in the landscape. Now I've kept this simple concept in my mind for quite a while now and I always think about it whenever I paint a landscape, especially when I'm painting outdoors. And this has helped me a lot to get my values right and achieve atmospheric depth within my paintings. The shadow here in the mountain is the slanting planes. Once I've painted the mountain shadows, I then paint the shadows in the embankment along the stream in the foreground. And this is a mix of ultramarine blue, with some quinacridone crimson, titanium white, and yellow oxide. The yellow oxide is gonna create a little bit of heat within the side of the embankment. I then mark in the tree shadows, the upright planes, and these are some of the darkest values to be found in the landscape, especially as they're nearer the foreground. For this, I used a mix of ultramarine blue with a little bit of yellow oxide. Lastly, I paint in the snow shadows, and I have to be careful here that the shadows and the snow is darker than the sky, but lighter than the exposed areas of the mountain that's also in shadow. The snow that's in shadow is a mix of ultramarine blue and titanium white, and I've also allowed some of that mountain shadow mix to blend in with it, but only a small amount. So far, I've been using number five and number two flat brushes, and this is gonna help create a loose painterly effect that's gonna make the painting look alive. Also, it helps to cover ground quickly. Now, I'm not gonna worry about detail in this background mountain at all because there's no need for it. Just having too much detail, I think, might confuse the eye. Normally, as I paint things in the distance, I go sparingly with the detail. Now that I've established my shadows, I'm going to start painting the areas that are in the full sunlight. And I start by painting the mountain slopes that are in the full sun. Now this is further away in the painting, but also it's mainly covered in tussock grass, which is of a low chroma colour. And chroma is another word for saturation. It's generally a pale straw coloured grass, but it can also look orange in the early morning and evening light. This colour is a mix of varying amounts of ultramarine blue, yellow oxide, burnt sienna, quinacridone crimson and titanium white. The titanium white, yellow oxide and burnt sienna are the more dominant colours in this mix. The bed of this small stream here is visible as the water is clear, so I use a mix of ultramarine blue with burnt sienna, yellow oxide and titanium white. And just like the mountain, the yellow oxide and burnt sienna are the more dominant colours in this mix. However, the ultramarine blue is going to give a bit of a green element, so it's kind of a greenish brown. Next I paint the snow on the mountain that's in the full sunlight. And I want to keep the value of the snow a little bit darker so that I can apply a few highlights onto it later on in the painting. And this is a mix of titanium white and then I also add in some of my mountain shadow mix to make the value of the white darker. I also add a bit more burnt sienna to it as well. You can see how adding the snow highlights instantly makes the mountain look a lot more realistic. And as I move down the mountain, I start painting the distant grass on the foothills. Now I need to make sure that this colour is not overly saturated, otherwise it's going to jump forward in the painting and I need it to sit back. I'm mainly using a mix of yellow oxide with cobalt teal, titanium white and some quinacridone crimson. 
The red in the quinacridone crimson being opposite to green on the colour wheel is going to help desaturate the green. Greens and yellows tend to drop out quite quickly as they recede into the distance, so it's really important here that our colours are not too saturated. And this of course is another way of achieving atmospheric depth, is by desaturating colours as we move into the distance. As I paint the foliage on the willow trees, I increase the saturation of my green and mix a combination of ultramarine blue with cadmium yellow, titanium white and quinacridone crimson. For the more orangey looking trees, I add some yellow oxide into the mix. And then I paint the foliage that's in light on the pine trees. Now pine tree foliage is generally quite dark, so here I mix ultramarine blue with yellow oxide. And I also mix in a little bit of burnt sienna. Now the yellow oxide in this mix is going to make the value of the green lighter, as yellow is generally a light value colour. I use a number 3 filbert brush to mark in the suggestion of branches and clumps of pine needles on those trees. I fill in some of those half tones within the trees by adding in some more ultramarine blue into my existing mix. I paint the shadows in the willow trees, again using ultramarine blue with yellow oxide, but then I also mix in some cadmium yellow just to increase the saturation a bit more. And I mark those tree shadows in. I then paint those areas of silty sand at the side of the stream. There's also lots of pebbles, rocks and boulders and scree from the mountain. And in general I found it to be a light value colour that's also low in chroma. So here what I've done is I've mixed ultramarine blue with burnt sienna and a lot of titanium white, keeping the mixture more on the burnt sienna side. Once I'd marked in the major zones in the painting, I then went back and started tidying the whole thing up, restating the darks and adding more highlights, especially to the mountain in the background. Now the liquid that I'd mixed in the paint was already starting to dry and I could use this to my advantage as it was making it easier for me to start adding highlights to the mountain even during the blocking in phase. Now the one thing I've been conscious of in this painting, and indeed any of my landscape paintings, is to try and maintain colour harmony throughout the painting, and we can do this by using common colours. This is why it can help to have a limited palette, because then you're much more likely to use those colours you have throughout the painting, and this is just going to make it more cohesive, and bind all these zones together within the painting. So I'm always conscious to carry the same colours throughout wherever I can. And of course one of the main colours I use throughout this painting is ultramarine blue. I added more details to the mountains and then I worked on those pine trees that are more towards the foreground, just adding more definition to their shapes. I found that a number 3 filbert brush is really useful for painting pine trees, especially because you have that rounded edge of the brush which you can create finer marks with. Now throughout this blocking in stage I've been a bit more conscious to add a bit more detail than I normally would during the blocking in stage so that I have less work to do once it's dry. An artist recently said to me about his own works that it's not so much what you paint in but what he leaves out. He said, can I say what I want to say with one brush mark instead of using ten? So this has got me thinking. I've also had it said to me from a couple of artists that a painting should look finished throughout every step of the process, so this is also something that's got me thinking. Now at this point I allow my painting to dry so that then I can come back and add a few final details to complete the painting. The painting is now dry and I'm just going to add a few more details to it and some highlights and then this will complete the painting. The blocking stage is where you want to make sure that all your colours and values and the overall composition of the painting is working, and then when you're happy with this, then you can start adding details. I'm going to be saving my final details and highlights till the end of the painting, and it's right at the end that I'll be adding the lightest values as well in this landscape. So I start painting the highlights on the snow that's in the full sunlight and this is a mix of titanium white with a little bit of yellow oxide that's going to warm up the white. 
So I'm just sparingly applying a few highlights here and that'll add to the realism of the mountain. There's also some highlights to be added to those willow trees and the pine trees that are in the foreground. Now I've used the same colours that I used during the blocking in stage but I've just made the value of those greens lighter. Now when painting the greens, particularly on the willow trees, when you add titanium white it's also going to desaturate the colour so you may need to re-increase the saturation by mixing in cadmium yellow which is really going to increase the chroma of the colour. Now I generally use cadmium colours in the foreground and midground, not so often in the background because they're just too saturated. And if the colour's too saturated in those distant landforms, we can lose that atmospheric depth. I'm mostly using a combination of number two flat brushes and number three filbert brushes. And I'm just restating some of those dark areas, just tidying up forms in the painting and adding lighter values to some of those existing colours, particularly the grass that's growing on the side of the bank and some of those little mounds of dirt there that are by the stream. Now I've gone for a bit of a less is more approach with this painting, so I've perhaps gone a little bit more sparingly on the detail than I normally have done. It is only a small 8x10 painting anyway, but sometimes I think having too much detail can spoil the composition a little bit or disrupt the flow and energy within the painting. I've seen a lot of landscape paintings with more loose brushwork and fewer details in them that are just really alive and vibrant. They're still realistic paintings, especially when you observe them from a distance. The human brain is very good at filling in the information that you leave out. Now I'm trying a few new things here with my painting and as subscribers to my channel you're actually witnessing my painting journey and seeing my paintings evolve in real time. It's pretty cool. Now whilst I'm experimenting with a few things with my landscape painting, I'll always continue to keep sharing my knowledge with you. I finished up this painting by adding my final highlights at the end. These are the lightest values in the painting, which were mainly the highlights on the stones in the foreground by the side of the riverbank, and then some of that sparkling reflective light of the water that's shimmering in the full sunlight. And this was just a mix of titanium white with a little bit of yellow oxide, and I applied this mix with a number zero round brush. As I finish up this painting, you should be able to see that I've used the darkest and lightest values in the foreground as well as my most saturated colours. Whereas in this background mountain you can see that the shadows are not quite as dark and the colours are not as saturated as they are in the foreground. So this is a way we can achieve atmospheric depth within our paintings. Now I was really pleased with the way this painting turned out and I just love painting these little 8x10s. I'm quite possibly going to use this painting as a study for a large artwork. I've also been framing some of my little paintings and just hanging them on my wall at home. Cool stuff. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did be sure to give it a like and subscribe to my channel. Also feel free to leave me a comment in the comments section below. Now if you'd like to learn more about painting then check out my website at samuelerp.com. I've got loads of free written painting tutorials that you can copy and you can use the reference photos and I also have some full length painting tutorial videos available for sale on there as well. Now I also have full length painting tutorial videos available on my Patreon channel which you can subscribe to for just $5 a month. You get instant access to all of my painting tutorial videos and a new full length painting tutorial video every month. I also provide reference photos and written notes as well if you'd like to have a go at painting it also. So check that out, I've put the link in the description below. Now if you'd like to see what artworks I'm working on then you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook and also my other website samuletfineart.com which is just to showcase my paintings so you can see some of my 
latest paintings on there. Anyway, all the links are in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Have a beautiful day and I shall see you in the next video.